All right. Shalom. First and foremost, I want to give all praise, all honor, and all glory to Yahweh. Ba'ashem, Yahweh Shai, Ba'ashem, Racha Kodash. I also want to give double honors to our apostles and our elders of Great Millstone. Peace and blessing and many salutations unto you elect across the four ones of this earth, fulfilling your lots and all truth and all sincerity. I am the priest Sha'ar from the Great Millstone Dallas branch, coming to you all with another lesson through the Spirit. And Lord's willing, this lesson here will be edifying unto the flock. And the names that you heard me mention, the name Yahweh and the name Yahweh Shai are the names of who the world calls God and Jesus Christ. The names as they are pronounced in the ancient Hebrew, which is the language that our forefathers being the Israelites spoke, our home, our home language, I'd rather say, that was given to us. That is the name in the language that was spoken of in the same tongue as the angels in heaven speak. Those are the two names that we call on to receive salvation. And you say Yahweh Bahashem, which is interpreted in the name of Yahweh Shai, Bahashem Rakakwadash, which is also in the name of the Holy Spirit. Now, today's lesson, what I want to touch up on today is water baptism. And the imposing question, is water baptism necessary to receive salvation? And this might be a question that some of you all have popped up in your head once in a blue moon. And this is um this is another lesson that's kind of an ongoing topic. I'd rather say this is another topic that's kind of ongoing. Every few months, we'll do lessons. You'll see a series of lessons of brothers touching up on this and then fall back because you have theological scholars, so-called Christians, as you will, that'll tell you that in order to receive salvation, you have to receive, literally, you got to be dumped in water pretty much. And they'll tell you that in order to receive salvation, you actually have to be baptized in the water. A name for that is called the baptism of John, which is also tied to repentance. But when you look at the baptism of John, that namely is the teaching of repentance and also the act of being submerged in water and coming out. And again, so-called Christians, and I say so-called Christians because actuality, we are the actual true Christians. But you have people that will we'll say that they're Christians, those that study up under uh, Christianity, so to speak, they'll tell you that that baptism is required to receive salvation. Then you got to think of it. Let's say all pandemonium's out here and it's the last few seconds of deliverance and there's still a little opportunity or a window that's opened up and there's no water around, but you have somebody that literally wants to repent. You mean to tell me you got to find a puddle and dump them in there? No. Mm -mm, it's not necessary. Now, for those of, you know, for people that want to get water baptized, is it wrong? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But ultimately, the true form of baptism to receive salvation is the baptism of Yahweh Shai. And I'm going to say it again. The true baptism to receive salvation is the baptism of Yahweh Shai, and that's receiving the word. Because ultimately, it's the word what cleanses you. Water can only take you so far, but it's the actual word that cleanses you. And it's also likened unto being cleansed by a fire as well. And there's actually a scripture that just came to mind here in the book of Jeremiah, the prophet. Let me find it. This is the book of Jeremiah, chapter two. And I'm going to jump straight to the point here in verse 22. It says, for though thou wash thee with nitri and take thee much soap, yet thine iniquity is marked before me, saith the Lord Yahweh. And when you go into this, Jeremiah is really just expressing the fact that actual the actual process of washing yourself is not going to cleanse you from your iniquities and your wickedness that you experience. Same with the actual water baptism of John the Baptist. Now, what did it act as? It acted as an expression, a figurative or symbolic expression of one being cleaned. And again, that's why it's called the baptism of repentance. But even after the apostle John, well, I'd rather say this John the Baptist, because technically the apostle John is John the revelator. But the word apostle means to be sent forth. But 
for this lesson's sake, John the Baptist, even after he left the scene, there was another way of baptism that was being done. Now, were there still people being baptized by the baptism of John? Absolutely. And you even have examples of it in the scriptures. And I'm going to pull those precepts out, too. But that's not the end all be all in order to receive salvation. All right. There was still something else that they had to do in order to receive that. And that's being cleansed by the word through the power of Yahweh Shai. All right. Now, I'm going to bring this precept out here in the book of Matthew, the third chapter. And this is the first account where you can actually find of John's baptism. You can find this in um, the Gospels. All right. Now, let's go to the Gospel of Matthew. And let's bring this out here in the third chapter. And I want to start at a good point. Let's start at verse 11. And this is John the Baptist actually speaking. And it reads, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. Because again, his baptism that he was doing in the Jordan River, when one will be submerged in water and be brought back out, that was called the baptism of John, which acted as a, a, a figure of repentance. Okay. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And after Yahweh Shai came on the scene and started his ministry, what happened to the ministry of John? It decreased. All right. Including the baptism of John decreased because there was another way of it that was being ushered in. Now, the apostle John, I'm sorry, I keep saying the apostle John, forgive me. John the baptism, his role was extremely important. And I'm going to continue to read down. It was extremely important. And I am not in one way from a fashion at all by any means undermining the ministry of John the Baptist because he was a great individual and a, pill, a pillar of this thing of ours. So by all means, I'm not discrediting the ministry of our forefather, John the Baptist. But I'm touching up on water baptism because that can be a stumbling block, especially for somebody that's newer coming in the faith because they might believe that it's required to be dumped in water just because you have certain theologian scholars that tells you what's necessary. They've told you this all your life as you grew up as a Christian. And you do have examples, even in the New Testament, of certain individuals still getting dumped in water. And that's why I said this. It's not going off, of course, by getting dumped in water. It's not going off. You're not sinning. You're not doing anything wrong. But just know that that is not the complete form. OK, that is not going to give you salvation. Now, I'm going to continue to read this here in John because there was a point that I was making going into the ministry of John and how it decreased after our Lord Yahweh Shai started his ministry. So let's read this here. In the book of Matthew, the third chapter, and I'm going to jump. I already read verse 11, so I'm going to read verse 12 as well. And it says, I'm like, matter of fact, let's let's end on verse 11 where I ended off. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire whose fan is in his hand and will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And that right there is acting as a similitude for the Lord. When he comes, when Yahweh Shai comes, he's going to burn up a lot of the unnecessary chaff. All right. Or the unnecessary undesirables that aren't meant for the new world to come in the first go around. All right. Now, when Yahweh Shai came on the scene and started his ministry, there was cleansing and baptism by the word that was being done. And we're baptism by the word as we suffer persecution, as we go through these things, this tribulation, which is the things that I'm talking about, which is required to enter into the kingdom. And quite frankly, when you understand Yahweh Shai and you've been blessed with the Holy Spirit, have you been baptized by the word? You step into the gauntlet of fire. When I say the gauntlet of fire, I'm just using that as coding for tribulation. But you do it willingly with the ready mind, understanding the price and the reward that comes with it for doing it in such manner, especially since we know that it was required for us anyway. Even in the book of Malachi, the third chapter, it goes into when Yahweh Shai comes and it says he's going to purge the sons of Levi. 
All right. And it also says he shall be like a fire's fire and a fuller's soap before it mentions purging the sons of Levi, going into the fact that we're going to be purged. And the sons of Levi represents the prophets, represents the elect in that verse. But ultimately, when it comes to serving Yahweh Shai and being blessed with the Holy Spirit, there's a purging process that take place. And your spirit is being purged. Your inward man is being purged from all the filth and gunk that it's acquired as you've lived among the Gentiles for all this time. And that dumping in water wasn't going to cleanse that. That's why I wanted to start this lesson off here in Jeremiah, the second chapter, how it made mention that you wash yourself a knee tree, but you still are full of your iniquities. The same thing applies. John the Baptist's baptism was a foreshadowing of something to come just along with John the Baptist's ministry, which his baptism is tied to his ministry. It was a foreshadowing of something greater that was to come. Okay. Now let's continue because I'm still in Matthew, the third chapter. Now let's read verse 13. It says, then cometh Yahweh from Galilee to Jordan and to John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him saying, I have need to be baptized of thee. And comest thou to me? So John's pretty much saying, look, I'm not worthy enough to baptize you. If anything, you need to be baptizing me. But let's see what it says afterwards. Verse 15. And Yahweh answered and said unto him, Suffer it to be so now. For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. So Yahweh said, look, these needs to happen in order for all righteousness to be fulfilled. And from that moment, you have Yahweh Shai's ministry that started. And I made mention earlier, and I'm going to bring out the verse going into when Yahweh Shai's ministry started. And when it started to increase, what took place with John the Baptist's ministry? It decreased. Did he still have recognition among the Jews that were throughout different areas? Absolutely. John the Baptist received fame. A lot of people knew about John the Baptist. All right. He, he didn't just, I mean, of course, he was baptizing in the Jordan River, but you have the remembrance of John the, Bap John the Baptist and his baptism throughout different areas of Israel. You had it throughout different areas of Turkey, which is Asia Minor, different parts of Greece, different parts of Rome. John the Baptist's baptism was known, and there was a few Israelites that was within those lands that would still exercise the baptism of John until they understood the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is Yahweh Shai's baptism. Now, I'm going to bring this out here in the book of St. John, the third chapter, and I'm going to start at verse 27 just to verify the point going into the increasing and the decreasing of John and Yahweh Shai's ministry. OK, so this is going to be in the book of St. John, chapter three, and I'm going to start at verse 27. And it says, matter of fact, let's um, let's start at verse 25, because this is when John was in prison. So this is John chapter three, verse 25. And it says, then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. Right. And purifying is ceremonial washing. And just as it popped up back then, you still have that question that pops up here today. Again, you have certain individuals that will tell you, look, you got to be baptized in water and dumped in water in order to be saved. And we're telling you, look, that's not the case. That's not the case. Just to give a quick testimony, when I was first baptized and dumped in water, and this is way before I knew about the truth. This was actually around the time where I graduated high school back in 2008. But I kid you not, I wasn't too much of a partier or a smoker or anything like that. But I'm just using this as an example. Around that time, I wasn't. When I got older, I got a little more on the wild side when I started college. But nevertheless, I got baptized and dumped in water. And that same night, I started smoking and I've never smoked. That was the, the most I've ever smoked in my life. Because, yeah, I smoked here and there before that, you know, when I was around my friends. But after that night, oh, it was it was a whole new it was a whole new level of of, of niggatry that entered into my body. Now, am I blaming it on the water baptism? No, but I'm just using that as an example. It didn't clean nothing from me. It didn't clean anything from me. It took me to receive the word and be immersed in the word and understand how to live my life through the Holy Spirit 
through the Rechah Kodesh and the power of Yahweh Shai, through the power of Yahweh Shai, in order to be converted into a new creature and to be purified. Okay? So let's jump back to John chapter 3, verse 25. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. John answered and said, a man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. Now, just because it says baptism does not mean that he was dumping them in water. All right. It does not mean that he was dumping them in water because you have the word baptism that was there in purifying. John the Baptist even said it. And that's why I wanted to read it in Matthew, the third chapter. He made the statement saying, I baptize with water, but he who cometh after me, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, shall baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit. So this is how Yahweh Shai was cleansing when he cast devils out and such. And they immediately repented afterward. He didn't dump them in water when those devils was casted out, when those works was being done. He didn't do that by he didn't dump them in water every time. No, he did that strictly by the power of his father. All right. And ultimately, when Yahweh Shai ascended into the right hand of his father, when he went into his glory, that's when the access of the Holy Spirit was given. And baptism of the Holy Spirit really was pushed throughout the church. When Yahweh Shai told the disciples in what Matthew, the 28th chapter, that they was going to have to wait for a time in Jerusalem until they received the Holy Ghost. What does that mean? They was baptized by the Holy Spirit. All right. And what did they do? Power was conveyed afterward. They were speaking in tongues, doing miracles, healing. And not everybody is, is going to be the same when they get baptized by the word. You have certain around that time. And I'm going to jump back to this in John as well. But around that time, you do read about a lot of those accounts where men were baptized by the Holy Spirit and they did start speaking in tongues. But you got to think about it, how the word was distributed back then. We were scattered in those areas in Asia Minor and how it was done back then. You know, the Holy Spirit was given to those men. To speak those languages because they was going to be going into those lands where you had actual Jews that knew that they were Jews and you had Israelites of the diaspora, another name for them, a Jew, oh, I'm sorry, Greeks and Gentiles, Israelites of the diaspora that was in those regions speaking those languages. Case in point, Acts, the second chapter, when Pentecost came, those men received the Holy Spirit and they started speaking in tongues that way that those Israelites that were coming in Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost could receive what they were saying. Okay. Now let's continue this here in the book of John, the third chapter. It says, John answered and said, a man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Mashiach or Messiah or Christ. It says Christ, but that I am sent before him. So he's saying, you've heard me clearly say I'm not the Messiah anyway. I'm only sent before him, meaning he was a forerunner to him. He was that bridge point to get them by to receive the right and correct way. Not that John was incorrect, but it took Yahweh Shai to show them all righteousness and what was required to fulfill it. OK, so let's continue. Verse 29. He that had the bride is the bridegroom. I'm going to say it again. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This, my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. So he's using an allegory. John the Baptist saying, look, you got the bride and you got the bridegroom. Then you got the friend of the bridegroom. The bride represents the elect. The bridegroom represents Yahweh Shai. And John was using himself as the best man. All right. The best man is still the one that's able to see the bride before the marriage. The best man is hands on within a lot of those marriage activities. All right. But it's ultimately the bridegroom. That's the one that chooses the bride. And that's where that matrimony happens. But it takes the bridegroom to handle a lot of those affairs. And he's using himself as an example of being that bride bridegroom. Even the Apostle Paul used himself as an example when he talked to the church in Corinth telling them that he was jealous over them with the godly jealousy 
because he had espoused them unto one husband, being Yahweh Shai. You know, so we all as ministers play a role as being bridegroomsmen at the same time being the bride, because ultimately those of us starting with the apostles on down that are in this word, we have a job to bid to the marriage. OK, so it's kind of like duality. We're still playing the bride, of course, but we're also playing brides, groomsmen, you know, for this whole marriage ceremony, which is a great role to play within this thing. All right. A very highly acknowledged role by our Lord. Now, let's jump to the point. Verse 30 is the point. This is John. He must increase, but I must decrease. The him increasing is Yahweh Shai, and the him decreasing is John the Baptist. And this is including their ministries as well. Because shortly after this, John the Baptist died. Yahweh Shai's ministry went on, and you still did have remnants of John's ministry that was out there. But throughout time, it dwindled away, including the baptism of repentance being put in water. Okay? Now, let's go into a few examples here. Let's first go into the book of Acts, the 18th chapter, just to go into some actual accounts. Because you do have people that will say, well, what about the Ethiopian eunuch? And this verse isn't about the Ethiopian eunuch. But yes, he was dumped in water. But what happened afterwards? He received the glory of the Lord. Now, he didn't have to be dumped in the water in order for it to happen. But that was the way the Lord had it written, because the Ethiopian eunuch required to be dumped in water, which is fine which is no problem, okay? But let's go into these examples right here of individuals that were corrected on pushing being dumped in water leads to salvation. This is the book of Acts chapter 18, verse 25. And let's jump to the point. I want to get to a good point. Let's see here. And this is going into um, Aquila and Priscilla and how they pretty much... Hold on. How Aquila and Priscilla pretty much expounded the treasures of Yahweh Shai in baptism to a man who goes by the name of Apollos. This is Acts chapter 18, verse 24. And it says, And certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. So out of how fervent that he was, he only knew one part. And that's going into the baptism of John, which is the baptism of repentance. And what's tied to that is the actual act of dumping somebody in the water. Now, did he get cursed out or rebuked for this? Absolutely not. But a further way got expounded to him for those that were following after Yahweh Shai. This is Acts 18 and 25. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord. I'm sorry. Verse 26. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of the Most High more perfectly. So they gave him a more perfect understanding on how to serve the Lord. Because again, Apollos only knew the baptism of John. All right. It had to get expounded to him a more thorough way of the baptism of Yahweh Shai, which is by fire in the Holy Spirit, as even John the Baptist said in Matthew, the third chapter. Now, let's continue. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he was come, helped them much which had brought through believed, excuse me, through grace. So I wanted to go into that one example going into how this man knew of the baptism of John, but perfection had to get expounded to him through Yahweh Shai. All right. And the Lord used a killer, namely a killer to expound that to Apollos. And let's go into another example here in the following chapter. And this is in the book of Acts chapter 19, starting at verse one. And it says, and it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. He said unto them, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And this is the point. And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Spirit. Now, what did John the Baptist say? I baptize with water. 
But he who cometh after me, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, shall baptize with fire and the Holy Spirit. And this is as Yahweh Shai's ministry increased. The baptism of the Holy Spirit was increased. And that's where you go into thousands being added unto the church. Okay? This is Yahweh Shai's ministry being increased. Now let's continue in verse 3. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then Paul said, Verily, John baptized with baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him. That is Yahweh Shai Mashiach. So even Paul quoted what John said. Did not John say that you should be baptized and who cometh after him? And that's what Paul said to those that were only acquainted with the baptism of John. Verse five, check this out. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Yahweh Shai. So immediately when they heard it, they was baptized in Yahweh Shai. And what happened after they were baptized in Yahweh Shai? Verse six. Then when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men of the synagogue, so like, and all the men were about 12. So this is about 12 individuals that were converted at that moment when Paul laid hands on them. All right. They spoke with tongues and they prophesied. And I said earlier, it's not necessary. I'm, I, when I say this, I, what I mean is when you get converted into this knowledge, not everybody's going to have the same gift. Yeah, you got examples of those men that did speak with tongues immediately, but that's because those tongues were more necessary around that time due to them traveling, especially Paul, especially Paul and Silas and those men that went into this, those areas of Asia Minor. Even of the 12, you had a handful of those men that ended up still teaching in foreign areas where Israelites was at. All you got to do is look how the apostles died, minus James, who actually died, you know, in the, in the actual land, you know, where the Jews were. You know, but going back to the point, when you get converted in this knowledge and you receive the word and receive the Holy Spirit, not everybody's going to speak in tongues. You got certain brothers that speak in tongues. You got certain brothers that have other gifts right here. It mentioned that they prophesied immediately afterwards. So when they were baptized in the name of Yahweh Shai, they immediately started prophesying is the point, which is what you see exactly here today. Individuals that have been converted into this knowledge receive the word of Yahweh Shai, have been baptized by the Holy Spirit and immediately start prophesying. It's really to the point where you can't help it. You can't help but to do it. You know, matter of fact, the quick precept just came to mind and it's going to be in the book of First Corinthians chapter 14. <laughs> Let's read this here. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse uh, eight. It says, for if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? And it's just going into back then in war times, if it was a strange sound of, you know, back then trumpets were blown when it was wartime. But if it gave a strange sound, you ain't know what was going on. Verse nine. So likewise, ye accept ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood. How shall it be known what is spoken for ye shall speak in the air? Hold on. There's a point that I wanted. So like it one sec. So like it, y'all. I read a little further down. I wanted 1 Corinthians 14 and 6, forgive me, which was still, I'm, I'm still glad I brought that out. But I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 14 and 5. And it said, I would that ye all speak with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. All right. So he's clearly saying if y'all all spoke tongues, cool. But I'd rather that y'all prophesied. And he's speaking to a church that was baptized by the Holy Spirit. So you got examples where immediately when they were baptized by the Holy Spirit, they spoke tongues. Yes. But that wasn't like that with everybody. Even in first Corinthians 12, the apostle Paul expounds on the many diverse gifts that comes with being converted in this knowledge. And he mentions part of it. It's tongues. You have certain that have the gifts of tongues, certain that have the gifts of diverse miracles, certain that have the gifts of prophecy, certain that have the gift of a few of those. All right. But it's all comes with being baptized by the Holy Spirit. These are the gifts that comes from heaven when you receive the word with full certainty. OK, now let's continue to read down in first Corinthians 14 and five. 
For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. Now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you? Except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophecy or by doctrine and even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds. How shall it be known what is piped or harped? So he's even going further, going into when you even prophesy, when you exude the gifts the Lord give you, it has to be done in a, profit, um, a proper way. It can't be done in an improper fashion, you know? So let's end it off here in the book of 1 Peter. I believe I touched upon a point, but let's end it here in the book of 1 Peter chapter 3. And I'm going to start at verse uh, 21. And it reads, matter of fact, let's start at verse uh, 19. And it says, by which also he, and that he being Yahweh Shai, went and preached unto the spirits in prison. And that's going into his ministry. When he came on the scene, he prophesied to us that was bound, bound by this flesh, bound by our enemies. Okay, bound by, bound by the, um, the, 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 the punishments and penalties that comes with violating the law. Okay, first Peter chapter three, verse 19 or verse 20, it says, which sometimes were disobedient when once the long suffering of the most high waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein few that is eight souls were saved by water. So now he's using the example of Noah and all of us should be clearly aware of Noah and what happened in the walk of Noah. Eight souls were only saved out of the whole world being flooded. Those eight souls being Noah, his three sons, and all four of their wives. Okay? But the point is in verse 21. The like figure, wherein to even baptism doeth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. All right? So it's not the actual water being put on you, put on you, excuse me, is what cleanses. All right? But what? But the answer of a good consciousness towards the Most High by the resurrection of Yahweh Shai. And Yahweh Shai's resurrection is what gave us access to actually receive the Holy Spirit and to preach and do what we do and say what we say. All this is through Yahweh Shai's ministry, his sacrifice, and his resurrection, as it was written of in Matthew the third chapter, even by John's words, he who cometh after me, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, shall baptize you with fire, and the Holy Spirit. And that's what clears your conscience. That's what clears your mind. That's what ultimately cleanses you, purifies you from the filth that you were part of. That's what cleanses you is receiving the word with readiness of mind. OK, so I'm going to end it off there. I believe I touched up on the point. Hopefully this was edifying. I want to give all praise, honor and glory to Yahweh, Bahashem, Yahweh Shai, Bahashem, Rechakwadash. I also want to give double honors to our apostles and our elders of Great Millstone. Peace and blessing and many salutations unto you elect across the four winds of this earth, fulfilling your lots in all truth and all sincerity. Shalom.